All right. You are live with Lions of the Godfather, West Coast Hip Hop, folks. This is what we do every Thursday. Today, we have an interesting guest coming on the show today, folks. I'm waiting for her right now. She should be here any minute. Uh, it's a long time friend, long time um, business associate, one of the most influential women in hip hop, especially here on the West Coast. In fact, all over the country, because she was always uh, a big hand to everybody. Uh, I'm waiting for her right now, so just stick around, folks. Stick around. Uh, sometimes folks get get a little late, but you know that's the only thing about b being live. Sometimes people forget or they get caught up. Uh, like, I fell asleep on my own show one time, so don't even trip. Today my guest is Violet Brown. I'm waiting for. Her. We've talked already. She said she was coming, and I know she's a woman of her word. So I'm gonna give her a few minutes to get here. In the meantime, folks, you're live lines with the Godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. And like I said, we get uh, from the West Coast to the East Coast and everything between, folks, you are live with the Godfather. And before we get too busy into this thing here, if you haven't done already, folks, please subscribe to the show. Like the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the notification bell, if you don't mind. That way, when we do stuff like this right here, you'll be notified to come on board. And it won't be, won't be no missing of the show. And just in case you didn't know, uh, your boy will be uh, honored in Atlanta uh, coming up in uh, November 21st. It's a big event. The Fathers of Hip Hop will all be out there. Uh, quite a few of my, my partners will be out there. I don't know the whole list. I don't have it in front of me right now. But the Fathers of, Fathers of Hip Hop will be honoring us in Atlanta Stadium. It's going to be a show. It's going to be uh, some trophies passed out. It should be pretty interesting. So please, if you get a chance to come out, I'll support it. In the meantime, as I wait for my guest, Miss Violet Brown, we'll just kick it for a few minutes. I'm going to go to the chat room for a minute, see what we got in the chat room, because sometimes my guests be a little late. That's all right. Uh, Montana Max, what's up, Doc? Yo, um, much love, Deuce Times. I will keep on getting these real guests. Lonzo, what's your favorite Cube album? Death Certificate by all means. Uh, who else we got here? Uh, wash Hands. Salute, Lonzo. Much love to you, folks. Uh, what we got here? Okay, yeah, yeah. We're still here. Much love to you also. Uh, Dodo Smoke. <laughs> I like that. Um, uh, Jesus Rojas. Is that Rojas? Hey, who's Rojas? My, I, I, hey, hey, hey. I'm, I'm an old Catholic school kid. What can I tell you? As we see that way from my guest to step on board with Father Brown, she should be here any minute. I asked her to come a little earlier. But um, unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it earlier, but I'm quite sure she'll be here. Uh, Miss, um, let me see here. Sup, Lonzo. Big A mentioned your show uh, that some ruthless dats ended up in Canada. Uh, were they ever recovered? I have no idea, Doc. I will give Big A a call to find out because dats were a were the main source of uh, story, storing albums. When we, we got through back in the day, we would mix an album. We would store them onto a dat. And that was, uh, like I said, our main way of uh, maintaining our product. So if they ever, if they were, uh, he may, he may know. I don't know that answer. Deuce time. You performing with Dre? <laughs> yeah, I'll be at the Super Bowl. Uh, yeah, I'll be. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good one, Doc. That's a good one. <laughs> Am I performing at the Super Bowl with Dre and Kendrick and Snoop? And uh, Mary J. Blige, no, I don't think so. And Eminem, I don't think so, Doc. Uh, I'm happy for all of them, but I don't think I'll be um, doing my record crew thing. Wouldn't that be interesting, though? Uh, death certificate, yes, sir. Um, what's up, uh, Gary Cummins? Much love to you folks. As we sit here and wait for my guest to step in any minute, I just resent her the link to the show, so hopefully she'll step in. Um, I mean, I, uh, she'll step in any minute now. That's the only problem with doing stuff live. Sometimes you get a technical glitch, but I like being live. I like the spontaneous, the spontaneity of being live. That's just something I've done live shows before on public access. And um, when you do stuff live, it's just, for me, it, it's the ultimate reality show, folks. The ultimate reality show. We have no script, no makeup. No hair, and I'm doing this for Google Google AdSense and the education of my folks out there, folks. I will say no paycheck, but they do send me a little something, something from time to time. Does the World Class Record Crew have a, a have any unreleased music? Not really, Doc. You know what? I 
to look. I, I had one album that was supposed to be released, and we never did do it, but it wasn't with Dre and him. It was with my other group, my other members, um, my boy Fat Rat and Miko and uh, some other folks. We never really, um, I think I got kind of disenchanted with the whole uh, music thing at that time because it was a lot going on um, with the company I was working with. So I'm going to have to say yeah, and I'm going to say no. I think some of it got leaked out. One of the songs got leaked out, but... Um, I'll check it. I'm going to look into it. All my stuff is on CD Baby. All my product is streamed on CD Baby. So if you want to find anything by Record Crew, the World Class Record Crew, the World Class Album, Wrapped in Romance, um, uh, what else I have on there? I have uh, 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 Homegrown, uh, the Homegrown Album is on there, the first compilation. Um, Compton Compilation is on CD Baby as well. So that is my that's my um, digital distributor of choice, CD Baby. So it's so all good, folks. Who else we got here today? Um, who's bigger group, Bone or Wu Tang? Woo! It all depends on who you ask, Doc. Um, Wu Tang has had more overall success. I think Bone may have sold more records, but Wu Tang seems to be a lot more. Excuse me. Uh, I just had lunch. Um, it seemed to be a lot more receptive to the um, for as careers after the mic goes on. As you very well know, um, Red Man and uh, Method Method Man especially is doing a lot of things on the screen in movies, whatever the case may be. So I haven't seen anybody from from Bone Thugs do anything like that. I know they have a couple of podcasts. And uh, Red Man and Bo and uh, 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 yeah, Wu Tang. I, I got to give it to Wu Tang. Kenny B said the same thing. Jermaine Dupree or Diddy? Uh, I now Jermaine Dupree got more hits to me. I don't know. I just yet. You just fucked me up. I just I just thought about Mary J. Blige and a bunch of other folks. Man, that's a good question. That's a good question. Bobby Brown just stepped in, folks. We're gonna get back to get back to the chat room in just a second. Bobby Brown, hello, darling. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I hear you fine, very much. Thank you for coming this out, is, baby. This is my third stop there uh, to find a place that I can do this. No internet. Oh shit! She just dropped out. Hold on there. Oh. Okay. okay there you go. There you go. Yeah. This is so my third. Third attempt here. I'm at somebody else's house now using their internet because mine is out in my building. Okay. Well, I'm glad you made it, Donald. I appreciate it. You're a trooper, though, Violet. You've always come to the rescue of hip hop. Anytime we needed you, you've always been there. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Lonzo. I was just introducing you, Violet, as one of the most influential one, one, of, one of the most influential women in hip hop, especially on the West Coast. Um, you were the buyer for a warehouse where nobody would bring us into the main chain stores. You took a chance on hip hop, but nobody else would. What made you do that? Well, uh, the way that I look at it is I have stores across the nation, right? And, uh, I think that there's room for everybody in some stores, even okay. if it's some rapper from Fresno, California, he's got friends and family in that would probably be interested in buying his uh, music. Okay. So, um, yeah. Lonzo, that? I'm sorry, my phone here is... They call it you? Hold on here. Let me put this on silent. All right. Okay, so, so anyway, uh, I figure that there's always a spot for an artist to sell product, you know? So I would take a shot on most anybody because I felt like there's always somebody that would want it, you know? So even if we put it only in Barstow and then waited till it started to happen elsewhere and move it across the country, that's what, we, or the state, that's what we would do. So, uh, yeah, I took a shot on people and a lot of people did not have distribution. They didn't know what distribution was. They would show up at my office, show up at my office with uh, their trunk loaded or whatever. Uh, just like uh, Hammer did back in the day. And um, 
I would always try to link them either with the distributor or if it was something that I could sell enough of, I could beg my company to allow me to buy it direct from them. But they hated when I did that. And I was the uh, only buyer. I was the only buyer that did that. So how, how did you get in that position? That's a powerful position. But how did you get in that position? Well, I had always collected music, and uh, I at one point I was the and I and I worked for other chains. I worked for Wallex Music City. Okay. I also worked for Knee High Record Distributors that uh, carried a lot of indie product, distributed indie product, and so um, I uh, when I came to Warehouse, I started in the stores. And I think they kind of saw where I was taking my stores because I would do a lot of uh, merchandising in my stores for, you know, urban music. Right, uh, okay. This is before even uh, rap happened. You know, I was doing uh, R&B and funk and whatever, you know, soul music, uh, stuff like that. So um, when uh, a position came open at our La Brea store, which was Big Ben's Records right, on the corner right. of La Brea and rodeo i eventually became the district manager of that store because they knew i loved that area and at one point the um store manager left that store and i said hey i want to step back and be a manager i want to go back and run a store and they said what you're going backwards <laughs> and i was like yeah i'm going backwards for that store i want to manage that store i love that store i love the area i was already doing things as a district manager in that area so yeah i wanted to run it so they said well we've never had a female manager in there We've certainly never had a white manager in there, but um, we'll we'll give you a chance. We'll put you in and see what happens. So I went into that store, um, started doing the block parties uh, that we would do with free concerts in the back for Black Music Month in June. Did a lot of big promotions with artists, set up a lot of gigantic in stores, and that particular store just started popping. And also... The, the kids that work in the store, I call them kids because they basically were at that point. Um, I was told that there was a problem with the crew there. You know, okay. I was told that they were lazy, uh, keep my eye on them, whatever that meant, you know. And so I went in and I assessed the people that was that were there and I came out and I said, you know what? These people uh, are great they're diamonds in the rough, believe it or not. I said, you can tell me whatever you want to tell me about them, but I'm working with them and I know what they're capable of. So what I started doing is if I had a, a clerk that loved uh, the t-shirt area or the uh, singles area or the videos or that sort of thing, I would say, you know what? I'm going to put you only in that area that you love and that's going to be your department now. You're in charge of that department. And pretty soon, kids started coming in on their time off, day off to straighten up the area. They be My sales shot through the roof. Everybody was happy. I was taking them with me to private parties and events. And, um, you know, we just did extremely well. So that's, and then when the position opened as the buyer for the chain, you know, I, I already had buying experience from somewhere else, you know, okay. before warehouse. And so I was like, you know what? I want to take a stab at buying again. So I stepped, I stepped into the corporate office as the buyer. And then I could do what I wanted to do in my one store. I could do it across the chain, you know. Okay. And so it really paid off, I think, for Warehouse to do that. Warehouse was a super powerful uh, uh, organization. Now, you were at the Big Bands right there on uh, La Brea and... Uh, Rodeo. Oh, rodeo. Now, that was around the corner from Cletus's store, right? It was not too far from Cletus's store. We, yeah. We, I had him on the show recently. He said you guys used to kill him sometime because you guys could buy so much product. It, it would be 50 cent or a quarter cheaper, sometimes a dollar cheaper, depending on what it was. And he said he could, it, it was hard for him to compete. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, Cletus got a lot of my money because I shopped in his store for things <laughs> that, uh, you know, I went over there all the time. And, and uh, Cletus, 
and Kelvin are both friends of mine, and especially Kel through the years, because I've stuck it out with Kel since he first started, you know, pretty much. And I talk to Kelvin every day. In fact, I'm involved with something that he's doing right now for VIP in Long okay. Beach. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, we could definitely buy stuff a little cheaper because I was buying so much. I mean, some of those POs I was writing – purchase orders I was writing was millions of dollars to some of these big distributors, you know, like I remember buying, you know, hundreds of thousands of one title occasionally, you know? So, yeah. Um, how, how, how much do you, do you miss the record business? I miss the old record business. Okay. I miss, I miss the, do you I miss the old, record, old, the old yes, record business? Yes, of course. You know, uh, getting to see you and getting to see people out in clubs every night at different shows, you know, uh, getting to see the customers face to face, come in and talking to them about product, turning them on to new music, you know, that uh, there's nothing really like it. You know, playing, like I remember one time, um, Clive Davis, in the very beginning of Whitney Houston, he called and said, I want to bring Whitney by your store. Uh, is it okay if she comes and hangs out for a while? And I was like, well, yeah. And I barely knew about Whitney because it was like so brand new, you know. Yeah. So uh, car pulls up. She gets out. She's the only person. There's no handler with her or anything. Comes in the store. Meet me. I meet her. And this is, I think, the first week of her album, maybe. And we were playing it in the store. And I told her, I go, watch what happens every time I play your record. And my uh, counter was quite high. It was like maybe seven, six, seven feet high something like that well not that high maybe like five feet high or something and she jumps up and sits on the end of my counter and okay. she's watching as i put on her album and people are buying it and people were walking up to the cash register sometimes walking right past whitney <laughs> not even knowing that she was sitting there or not even paying attention to her and she's just watching people buy her record you know wow. there, there was nothing like that you know putting on a record and and watching the response in the store watching people just gravitate to that bin and just grab them you know um so i mean we had a dj booth in the store and right. i i dj'd for about 26 years too so i loved spending music because you know i wasn't spending in the club well i still did some clubs and house parties and things like that but i could spend every day in the store if i wanted right. to you know right. and i had a ball with it you know and so did a lot of my clerks you know, I uh, I talk about the old record business. I think one of the things I miss about the old record business probably the most is the um, the, the parties, the magazine parties, and the conventions. The, the yeah. uh, BR the BRE convention, um, the 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 NARM, NAM convention, the national no, NARM National Association NARM. of Record Merchants NARM. And the Jack the Rapper convention. Jack okay? the Rapper, Jack the yeah. Rapper, and Urban Network. Oh my god, Urban gosh. Network. Yeah, I, you know, it, these 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 this new generation will never understand what it would be like to get on a plane and drive cross country just to go to a convention and hang out with stars because everybody would be there. Oh, okay? everybody! 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 Would be there. Everybody! everybody. Would be there. And and then, oh, well, for me, when I tell people about, about people ask about my jackets, and I'm quite sure you can attest to this. I think VIP had jackets also. Yeah. Everybody had their own custom jacket, no matter what label you were with. Warner Brothers, Motown, everybody had a custom made jacket. And you in the lobby, and you had everybody had on their jackets. And it was so, it was like, it was like record gangs, but it wasn't, it wasn't gang banging. But you'd had, you know, the marketing yeah. department. If you were a um, uh, A&R or marketing or promotion, you had on a jacket and your company sent you there. But a lot of times I was independent. I would buy a ticket myself and go down there just to hang out. Especially, oh, I know. Yeah. And, and then, then a, lot, a lot of those labels would uh, send those jackets to me right before the event, wow. you know. And they would say, oh, you got to wear my jacket, you know. And I was like, well... Def Jam sent a jacket yesterday and, you know, prior or um, uh, Jive sent something. And, you know, so, you know, here I was doing this uh, 
uh, ch- exchange of jackets all through the damn conference, you know, or hats, you know, things like that. But yeah, you could go there and see like in a ballroom at a hotel, the equivalent of up in smoke almost <laughs> was right there in the hotel, the up okay. in smoke concert, you know, right. uh, I'm talking about the tour. The equivalent of that was right there in the hotel ballroom because, right. you know, you had the death row party, you know, uh, Snoop was in there performing, Dre was in there, you know, uh, or maybe you had like all the guys of jive you know were up there right. spice one uh too short e40 you know it was just a who's who of hip-hop and and r&b but R&B. So, yeah. yeah and r&b it, yeah it, it, it was just and, and this is before, my time it was before they got before the violence came in before they started fighting we never yeah. had a problem. We never had problems like that. I mean, the most you would do is somebody get drunk and throw up on somebody. Okay, that was oh, yeah. most, somebody. Cause it was it was liquor flying everywhere. Yeah. Everybody had every label had a party and every everybody label. was drunk. Yeah, the hotel room was ringing and the film was the whole. It was it was just it was just a hell of a real time. Oh yeah, I, you couldn't I, you you didn't you didn't think that you could go in your room and get some sleep at any point because that wasn't happening. You know, there was no. party. The guy next door to you was having a party in a room right. that was just for one person. He's having a party with 50 people up in there. You know, there was parties everywhere, you know, and, and everyone, everybody wanted to go to the Luke party always, you know, we oh, want to go to the two, we to go to the two live crew party, the Luke party, you know? So yeah, but at that conference too, or at the conferences, you know, that's where the labels would bring their artists for the very first time. Time to meet people you know I remember when Mary J Blige came out and performed I think it was at it was either at Jack the Rapper or Urban Network where they brought her out to perform and uh, I remember the outfit that she had on it looked like she bought it up at the Sloss and Swap Me you know it was not <laughs> It was not the Mary that we see today, you know. Okay. It was the heart and the soul of Mary for sure. Okay. But the look wasn't quite, it's not what we're used to from Mary nowadays. But, you know, that's what we would see. People in the very beginning, the raw talent, the outfits, the way they looked, you know, the attitude, uh, not knowing exactly how to work the stage, you know, uh, is fantastic those conferences now, now, now quick question of all the artists you work with did you have somebody that, that you just didn't think was gonna make it that surprised you or somebody you thought was gonna make it and didn't make it um well in listening to uh i told you that hammer came up to my office with right. his own with his own music okay. um I listened to it. He gave it to me and I listened to it. I put on the first, I think it was a 12 inch single and it was a double back with ring them on one side and maybe uh, I forget what the other song was on the other side, but there was like a uh, two basic hits that ended up being hits for him. And when I listen, Oh, the thrill is gone or whatever. But when I listened to it, I was like, Okay, uh, I'm not quite sure how this is going to work. You know, I hear a little something, and yeah, he's from Oakland, and I know that he owns the Troop Clothing Company, and he's very involved with the Oakland A's or whatever. So, um, you know, maybe maybe he'll have enough juice up there to make it happen, but I, when I listened to his music, I was only so-so on it. But then when he comes in and really sits in my office, this guy had the, the, his confidence was on a level 15 and he, he told me straight out, I'm going to be the biggest rap star of all time. I'm going to sell the most albums, the most records. I'm going to play stadiums all around the world. This is how he was talking when he first came to see me. And okay. I, and he was very animated, stood up, talking loud, very loud. Like people kept coming by my office going, what the heck's going on in there? You know, like, okay. and so, you know, he was so confident that I was like, okay, this is going to work. 
it's going to work. You know, he's just too confident, you know. And then after that, every time we would go to a restaurant, he's telling the people at the chart house that he's going to be the biggest star, the biggest rapper, you know. And, you know, at one point they said to us, you know what, you, if you guys can't keep it quiet, you know, we're going to move you upstairs. And then I said, why just move us upstairs? Because he's not going to be quiet, you know. So, but yeah, I like for him, um, I wasn't exactly sure from his music where he was headed but with his confidence his attitude his persistence i knew that something would happen with him but um yeah there's been records that you know they weren't great but like i told you before you know there's always a home for somebody you know yeah. somewhere your mom your your you know your brothers your sisters your right, school right. friends or whatever they're gonna come out and buy it did you ever? I, I, I know you worked with uh, Tech Nine uh, yeah. at one point in time. How, how did you Tech Nine hook up? Um, I was at my office one day and I got a phone call from uh, Travis O'Gwen and Tech together, and they said that they wanted to uh, drop by my office and play some music for me. And oh, let me go back a little bit. Sway and Tech show. That's okay. how I first heard Tech. He was on the Sway and Tech show, and he was doing that fast rap and all of that live, you know. And I was like, "This guy's amazing." I mean, what the hell are we, where are we listening to here? You know, this is crazy. So it wasn't long after that that I got that phone call, and they wanted to come by my office. And then I said, "Oh, Tech Nine, yeah, I think I heard you on the Sway and Tech show." And he said, yeah, 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 I was real involved with Sway and Tech. So I said, well, I don't have time to meet with you because I have another thing going uh, after work. I go, but you could drop the music by to me. So they dropped by the album, which is Angelic, his first big release. And uh, I listened to the whole album. And to me, still, that's his best album. But, uh, you know, he's released a million albums now, and they all they all sell and they all do well. But Angelic, there was something so special about that album. So I called them up. I listened to it. I called them up, and I said, wow. I go, I can't believe what I'm listening to. I said, are you guys going to be around tomorrow? And they said, oh, yeah, sure, sure, which they weren't. You know, they were leaving, but they decided to stay because I wanted to meet with them. So they come by my office the next day, and that's when I heard the whole story of his connection to Quincy Jones and how he was on uh, the, I think, Above the Rim uh, soundtrack or Gang related one of those soundtracks he did the song questions how he uh hung out with uh Pac. you know i learned a lot about him and i was like wow uh this story is happening in kansas city and nobody knows about you over here like like kansas city so after i got to know him I would go to Kansas City, and in Kansas City, he was Tupac. He was he mm. he is gigantic. I mean, yeah. unbelievably huge, you know. So um, yeah, so that's how I hooked up with them. And then when Warehouse uh, went um, under, I stayed with the new company that bought us for a while. And then I got a job, and I went to Strange Music for a while with them. Okay. So. Okay. Now, I, I got a question. People always ask me this question. I'm going to ask it to you. Biggie, Tupac, Easy. Of those three brothers that left, left us way too soon, which one affected you personally most, the most? Easy. Without okay, a why? doubt. Easy. Okay. You know, um, Easy, I was there from the beginning, you know, of NWA. Uh, I was around the rhodium swap meet with Steve Yano. Okay. I think that, I think that you went out there and got records from Steve. You know, I was one of those people there because at the time I was doing clubs. And so I was one of those Saturday morning people. You had to be there at the crack of dawn, you know, when <laughs> Steve pulled in and you're saying, what's the new shit? Let, I need it now. You know, so... Um, yeah, so I met Easy back then. Uh, it's weird calling him Easy because I met him as Eric, and I've always called him Eric. And when he, everything that he signed for me through the years, he always signed it as Eric. He never mm. put Easy E on anything. I, 
I don't think he ever put easy. He would always put Eric and then he would underline it, you know? Uh, But yeah, he became uh, close with me. He would come to my office all the time. Uh, When he first um, had bone, um, he uh, called me up and he goes, where are you? He goes, where are you at? And I said, I'm out at my store, La Brea and Rodeo. I had to come out here because I have a meeting with a record label. And this is when I was the buyer, right? I said, I'm meeting him out here. And he goes, oh, he goes, and I go, where are you? And he goes, well, I'm in your office. And I go, why are you in my office? And he goes, because I have somebody I want you to meet. And I was like, okay, who is it? And he goes, I'll come right now. And I said, no, I don't have time for you to come right now. I said, I'm leaving within 20 minutes. And he goes, no, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I said, you're not going to make it from Torrance to over here in 20 minutes. You're not. And he was like, yes, just stay there. And he goes, bye. And then he hung up the phone. And I was like, oh my gosh, because he'll get stopped along the way, talking to girls or whatever, Uh, you know, he's (laughs) not going to make it here. So about 20 minutes later, his Suzuki Samurai drives in the parking lot, top speed, parks in front of the store, and out comes all these people out of the Suzuki Samurai. It looked like a clown car with people (laughs) getting out, getting out, getting out you know and i said who is this and he goes this is bone thugs and harmony he goes they're from ohio he goes they're the next thing man you gotta hear them and he goes we want to give you the tape so he handed me a cassette tape and then eric and typical fashion he always wrote every phone number that he had on him you know on the back of the cassette he goes, I need you to call me as soon as you listen to this. And I go, it's not going to be until much later, Eric. I go, because I've got, I'm going to a reggae show after this at the Hollywood Bowl or whatever, or Greek. I said, so it's going to be late. So he goes, okay. He goes, just call me even if it's late. And I was like, okay. So on the way to the concert, I picked up a friend of mine, this Rasta, and I put in the tape. I go, oh, Eric came by the office. He dropped this on me. I go, let's listen to this. So I put it in and it was like, I'd never heard anything like that before either. I mean, you remember probably when you first heard Bone Thugs and Harmony, you go, what the fuck is this? I mean, <laughs> Jesus, you know, they're actually, they're in harmony. They're, I mean, is it rap? Is it singing? What, um, it's amazing, you know? So I got home uh, from the concert that night and I woke up my kids in the middle of the night. I mean, I was probably like, after midnight or something and i woke them up and i said you guys get up and they go why and i go eric brought this cassette you have to hear it i go you have to hear it and so they said are you kidding me you're waking me up to hear this and i go yeah i am get up and so then they got up they sat there and listened to it and they go yeah it's pretty good and i go pretty good i go what the hell and so i called eric and i said wow these guys are going to be gigantic and he goes well they're out here with me now he goes and they didn't even have bring their draws with them he goes i had to go to buy them their draws you know their underwear and you know so uh yeah so i was very close with him he died on my birthday my two boys My two boys that I woke up that night, they used to babysit uh, his kids occasionally. Like if he was going from one mom to maybe somewhere else, he would leave some kids behind. You know, like if he had the kids, maybe Derek or whatever with us for a while and my boys. But, yeah, I was very close with Eric, you know, that. You know, know, easy with one of them dudes, you know, as everybody, he had the gangster persona, but he was really with a family guy. Okay. Oh, he totally was. He, he and was a family guy. He had his kids in tow all the time. Yeah. And he and people didn't know the behind the scenes things he was doing. You know, like if somebody um boy, this there's no lighting in this place. Shoot. You, you, you're looking good. You're looking good. Okay. So um anyway, uh yeah, people didn't know that there was behind the scenes things he was doing. Like if somebody, you know, died and got killed and it was some sort of a gang related thing or something, they had no money, family freaking out. I mean, Eric would secretly go and pay for funerals and things like that, you know, like 
he was so generous, you know, just really a good guy. Yeah, yeah he definitely was. Um, when, when Train, when DJ Train died, uh, yep. that was, that's one of the things he had me do for him. Hey, man, I can't go out of there because you come up here and pick up this money and drop it off the Train family like it was nobody's business, you know. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, DLC's accident too. Uh, he contributed to the hospital bills with that as well, is wow. what I was told. So yeah. Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, and he, you know, that um, studio where they used to record things at in uh, Torrance. Uh, audio, audio achievements. Audio achievements with Donovan. Right. That was not far from my office. Not so. at all. Right in the corner. Yeah, not too far. And uh, we would often go to that Mexican restaurant there, right La Capilla. Yeah. yeah, La Capilla. And yeah. um, I, imagine going in that restaurant in Torrance and you see all of NWA just sitting there, you know, or I'm eating, they start to walk out and I'm with my friends from work and NWA comes to the table to say hi, you know, like, wow, so weird. And uh, also the Chuck E. Cheese in Lakewood, when Derek turned one years old, they had uh -huh. a big birthday party for him. You were probably there, Lonzo, at the, at the Chuck E. Cheese, because everybody was there. And uh, if you can imagine going into a damn Chuck E. Cheese kid's place, you look over and all of NWA, Jerry Heller, all the <laughs> friends and family of NWA, other rappers are up in there for Derek's little birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. I wow. mean, how crazy is that? That is crazy. I didn't make that one about it. I didn't make that party, but I, uh, I heard about it. Okay, that well, that, party, that, was, that was super early on, but I do know that you were part of that early, super early on. You yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, what are you doing now, Violet? Well, now I write a blog for an entertainment company, so I'm writing, and it's a big distribution house in uh, Irvine, California, and they carry absolutely everything, the majors, the indie product, everything, and they carry movies, music, uh, uh, you name it, they got it, and so I pretty much write from uh, their catalog of things that they have. They give me a topic for the month, like right now it was women in music and for this right. month, so I was writing about about a lot of women and not just uh, certain genres, not just R&B, but just writing about, you know, women in rock, w women in rap, women in, uh, uh, you know, all the different genres I write about. So this particular month that's coming up, of course, there's a lot of horror films I'm gonna be writing about. So I'm having a ball doing that, you know, and I just wrote about the Smithsonian Institute Anthology of Rap, which yeah. was uh, really great writing about that because I was involved in uh, choosing the songs for that way back in okay. the day, and it finally okay. is released. Okay. So, yeah. Interesting, interesting, okay. Um, how do you feel about today's music? Rap music. Uh, well, I I like some of it. Uh, some of it I don't. You know, like I'm I find myself listening to uh, uh, Rock the Bells radio a lot because <laughs> a lot of the new stuff I'm only so so with. But I force myself to listen to a lot of new artists and to uh, find new artists because I don't want to be one of those people that are only listening to old school hip hop, you know? So, you I know, uh, a lot of them, I more. don't know the names. I just know, you know, I like that song after hearing it like 50,000 times or whatever, okay. you know? Okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to find some light in this house okay. here. Okay. Now, by the quick question, if, okay, now, yeah. as you, there you go. Yeah. Back in the day, the, 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 the uh, person at the at the register or the DJ at the record store were all it was salesmen, okay? Because you came in, if you look at, if you came in looking for Rick James, check out this right here, okay? Check out Tina Marie. If you came yep. in looking for one thing, you you always get turned on to something else. Yeah. Because my theory is, I got a theory. I got a theory. If a lot of these artists, if people had to go and buy music the same way. Back in the day that they did, well, well they, they had to buy music today the way they did back in the day. We had to get in your car and spend some physical money and make a choice because...
Back then, the single was like five five ninety nine. Yep. You had to make a choice between this this five ninety nine single and eating a day. Okay. Yep. Would would we have the same? Would people be as successful as they are if they had to buy music the same way they did back in the day? I'm just wondering. Um, you think that might be the people might be as successful if they had to do it the old school way? A lot of these new artists. Um. Well. The way I look at it now, Lonzo, is we don't have record stores everywhere. We do have some independent stores here and there. Okay. But if you have a phone in your pocket, you have a, a record store you're carrying in your pocket 24-7. Okay. So you can always find, you know, music to buy. And often, you know, some of these sites that will tell you, oh, uh, if you don't, if you like this, you'll like this too, right. you know, okay. like Shazam or whatever, you know, when you uh, look up a song. So, um, you know, I think that music is selling uh, so well right now because you can find stuff all over the world. Like if there's a guy that's busting out in uh, Kenya or somewhere right. in Germany or whatever, and you hear about him, you can find him very easily, you know, so... Right. Um, I think, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, it was fun back then, you know, uh, telling people, yeah, if you, if you like Rick James, you're going to love Tina Marie, or you're going to love this new Prince record, or you're going to love, right, you know, right. stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It seems like a lot of records are selling, but are they making the money anymore? Okay. You know, okay. like. How much are you going to make off of a download? Pennies. 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 Yeah, one, one time I remember an artist showing me the uh, report that came from um, digital sales, and it was a big, thick, like a big, thick book, you know? Okay. And he said, this represents $3,000. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, wow. about $3,300 in sales from all of this wow. right here. Wow, you know? that's great. They, crazy. They, they, uh, Google don't even send me mine like that. They send me mine on, on a little bitty jump drive. They don't even want to mm. print it out. It's, it's too much money to print out. So they, yeah. And it, it, here lately, I got a, I actually got some checks, checks, paper checks from some streaming services. I got five checks, all five checks together did not add up to the cost of the postage. Oh, my God. All five checks did not add up to the cost of the postage. Postage is, what, 45 cents? Five wow. checks. I, was, I think all five checks. I mean, I got literally got checks for $2, 22 cents, 32 cents. I'm like, damn, you could have kept this shit right here, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's insulting. <laughs> now, I got, a question, I got a question from the chat room. My man, Scotty D, Scotty Spencer, wants to ask Violet, how many music and movie plaques do you have? Is this Scott Spencer that I know? Yes, it, yes it is. That's why okay. he asked that question. Okay, and he said, "How many plaques do I have?" Uh, how many movie and a uh, TV movie and uh, record plaques do you have? Well, gosh, you know, I've been getting the my first plaque that I ever got was back in the day for Saturday Night Fever. If that tells wow. you how far back. Okay. okay. So. Um, and since then, and if you could imagine how many years ago that was, uh, I was often in stores that, um, uh, you know, I was involved with all genres of music, not just okay. hip hop or R&B. So if something, because uh, to me, I do listen to everything. And if something strikes a chord with me and I love it, I, I don't care what it is right. if it's something great. So uh, I started getting plaques, you know, for all different genres of music. I would get these plaques, you know, that they put like a bunch of albums on one plaque. You know, this one sold 500,000, this one 200,000, whatever. So I got all those kind of things. Um, I've got too many plaques to hang in my house for I certain. I've got them everywhere. I've I got them stored, stored away. Um, I've got hundreds of plaques. Uh, hmm. And you know what? It's really cool, but it's also a burden because if yeah, you move yeah. or something, you hassle. know, and, and somebody said to me, they go, 
why don't you sell your plaques? You know, like uh, they're they're uh, selling for a lot of money. And I was like, I will never sell a plaque with my name on it. I go, uh, I've been in record stores. Like one time I was in a record store, uh, the people that opened Amoeba, they used to have a, a different store in the Bay Area. And I went in there and uh, I saw a plaque on the wall with somebody's name on it that I knew. And it was a Funkadelic plaque. And I was like, how much is that plaque? And it was a couple hundred dollars. And I was like, I'm buying it. So I bought it to give back to the person, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, because I, it's just horrible to see people's names that, you know, where they had to sell those plaques, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I would never sell a plaque. Okay. So, right. uh, easy. Steve asked me, um, do you have any interaction with Tamika Wright? Um, Occasionally, uh, if there's something that Tamika's working on where she wants me to be involved, like an interview or something like that, you know, she calls and um, I help her out if, she, if I can in any way, you know. Okay. I don't talk to her very much, you know. It's basically if, you know, if she's working on something and needs my help. Sometimes on my birthday, because it's the same day that Eric died, she'll wow. send me a happy birthday or something, you know? Okay, okay. Because, uh, of course, she's going to remember that date. Do you do any music consulting? And if so, how can they contact you? Um, well, you can contact me through Violet Brown at live.com. That's my email. I'm also on Instagram under the Violet Brown, and I'm on Facebook under Violet Brown. Um, if you DM me or something, I'll give you my phone number. I don't want to blurt it out right here, right now, okay. but because uh, that would be too much. But uh, I give up my phone number to people, and I take the calls. And if you give me your music, I actually listen to it. You know, people used to uh, say, to me, I can't believe you listen to all this stuff because uh, for a while I was an A&R consultant too for record labels and I would get so many demos and also the other A&R people that were on, that were in staff in those companies would send them to me as the A&R consultant to kind of do their work and listen to it for them, you know? Okay. So I got bags and bags of, uh, of tapes and CDs and I took the time to listen, you know, and sometimes people, I see other people, they would put on one song, it was horrible, so they toss it to the side. Well, I would go through and listen to a few minutes of each song to see if there was something there, you know? Okay. So, okay. yeah. That, baby, that's commendable. That is very commendable right there. That's, well, that's why you are who you are. Yeah. It took a lot of time, that's for sure. Definitely takes a lot of time, and that's the yeah. part that a lot of people, a lot of people don't, don't want to be bothered with. It can take a lot of time. Violet, oh, yeah. I, I know you're busy. I, I thank you for taking the time out to kick it with us today. And you've always been, you know what? I got to give you your flowers right now because you've always been this way with all of us. If we call you, you answer the phone, and if you can help, you you will, okay? Yeah, and I always. I want to say thank you for the West Coast. I want to th say thank you for the East Coast. Uh, up north, gangster rap, hip hop, disco, country and western, <laughs> Makota Records, everybody, because yeah. you've been there. You've always had an open door policy to everybody when they came to you to, with anything, and I appreciate that. And I know the rest and, of them do too. And Lonzo, you were pretty much the same. So I mean, you know, so you were always true. there, and uh, people could talk, talk, step to you, and and you would point them in the right direction of where they need to be, what they That's need why. to be doing. Yeah. That's why I do this show. Because people like yourself, and I, I've interviewed Kelvin Anderson, Cletus, people need to know the backbone of West Coast music. I mean, you are a, you're a, true, you're a legend. You're a legend from a retail standpoint, okay? And from R&R &A and, and from uh, blogging now. So everything you've done has always been to the betterment of music. And you're a true music lover, a DJ, the whole nine yards, like myself. I guess that, maybe, maybe that's what it is. We're DJs. And we have to be open because you never know when you're going to get that next hit. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. Never know. You're and, be uh, you know, I'm uh, working with a fitness uh, 
a person too that's doing classes on the beach and we uh jump on these jump boots and the music's super i mean just super I see, great i've seen you do that i've seen yeah, that. yeah and so it's fun choosing the music for that and she's a long time dj too from florida okay. and she's been uh, my friend about 12 years we've been doing that on the beach so you know that brings me out to uh play good music for people every single weekend okay. so one more yeah. time, Violet, tell them where they, where, where they can find you at one more time, dear. On Instagram under the Violet Brown, on uh, Facebook under Violet Brown, and on my email is violetbrown at live.com. And if you hit me up in any of those ways and you want to talk, uh, we can. I'll give you my phone number or you can uh, just hit me on the Facebook uh, phone or video chat or something like that. Violet, thank you again, Dollar, for taking time out through this interview. I really appreciate it. Much love All to right. you. All right. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. All right, Dollar. All right, Bye. folks. Bye. All right, folks, you're live with Lonzo, the Godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. And you just heard, an, uh, uh, I ain't going to say exclusive, but a very interesting interview from my girl, Violet Brown. And before I go, folks, I got I to gotta plug this event. I'll be honored live at uh, November 21st out in Atlanta, the view in the Riverside area. Apple Valley, I think it's at that Apple Valley, wherever it may be. Check us out, folks, at the Atlanto Stadium. In the meantime, folks, this is Lonzo, the godfather of West Coast hip hop. And like I say every week, y'all, from the West Coast to the East Coast and everything in between, folks, from Eve after dark to concerts in the park, we still do it live, y'all, here every Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'm out of here. Don't forget, y'all, subscribe, like, and share. Subscribe, like, and share. We're out of here, y'all. Peace.